I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. This is a very special podcast episode of Truth of the Matter. We have with us one of the greatest singers to ever walk the earth, one of the greatest musicians to ever walk the earth, Mr. Aaron Neville. Many of you will know from his time with the Neville Brothers, from singing with Linda Ronstadt, singing with Trisha Yearwood. Aaron's a a five-time Grammy Award winner, an all-around great representative of the musician's community, and he sung some of the greatest songs that anybody's ever heard. Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. You've got a new book out called Tell It Like It Is. What made you uh, pick up the pen and write a book? Well, it's been in my head, you know, like... uh... The Neville Brothers did a book some years back, and everything didn't go in that book, so I figured it was time before I get out of here to put my life, the whole truth and nothing but the truth on in the book. Was it hard to go back through everything? I mean, you've been through some really tough times. You've been through some really great times, but was it hard to talk about the tough times? I mean, one of the things in this book that really strikes me is you can hear your distinct voice through it in the cadence of the way you wrote. The story about that, the lady that helped me write it, Beth Adelman, that was the first thing she said. She said, Aaron, I want the book to be in your voice. She listened to me. Well, it really is. And for readers who have got to go out and get this book, this book reads like a conversation because you're talking conversationally and you're writing conversationally and you talk about what it was like growing up in New Orleans with your brothers, your parents, how you came to music in the first place. Can you tell us about that? How did you come to music in the first place? Well, my brother Art tell me the story that when I was a little baby in the crib, that I'd stand and go, ah, until I fell asleep. So I guess I was probably trying to sing then. But later on, I was about 11 years old, Art had a doo group that sit out on the park bench in the Cali Project and harmonized. They'd run me away until they figured I could hold a note, then they'd let me sing with them and show them how to do all the harmonies. So I can do all the harmonies, just not at once. <laughs> That's right. When did you know that you actually had a gift? I mean, when people think about singers, they think about Marvin Gaye, they think about Otis Redding, they think about Aaron Neville, Solomon Burke, some of the greatest voices to ever be put on record. When did you know that you had a voice that people would want to hear? Well, when I was about eight years old, I used to go to the movie at the gym theater and sing my way in. They let me in free and give me candy. Because you were such a good singer. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of songs were the first songs you sang? My mom and dad had all the Nat King Cole songs, and my brother Art would bring on the doo-wops. I was a Clyde McFadden fan, uh, Sonny Till and the Oreos, the Clovers. I want to talk about the song Tell It Like It Is, it was a colossal hit. How did you get into singing it? And tell us the story of Tell It Like It Is, the song. Well, Tell It Like It Is was written for me by a fellow named Lee Diamond. While we were in the studio, I was thinking about an up-tempo song, you know, and my brother all said, no, 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 Tell It Like It Is, that's the one. And he was right, because when it came out, it like sold about 40,000 copies in New Orleans and started going up the charts. Like wildfire. I took maybe about five takes, you know. They took the first one because of the innocence of it. Because after that, you're trying to think of and, you know, duplicate. But that innocence is there, you know. First take. Yeah. And what happened after that when you started selling a lot of records and started getting recognition? Well, I had people coming at me to manage me. And a lot of them just talked a lot of dumb stuff, you know. And this guy named Joe Jones, he was a managing the girl group, the Dixie Cups, and a friend of ours, Alvin Shine Robinson. So he came into town and he got me hooked up with him. And he got me my first photo shot, my first suits, you know, clothes to wear, and had my music and everything, and made sure I was getting some money for the gigs. And So I thank him for that. It was a real success. But you came from pretty humble beginnings. You grew up in Calliope Projects. What was that like growing up in the Calliope? When we moved, there was a brand new project, and we were like one of the first families there. I was one year old, and it was like a paradise. It was like we had an oval, like play area with, with a sidewalk that went all around so you could skate or ride your bike. And we played marbles and spin tops and had made our own kites and 
it was like a paradise back then, the project. Like I tell I say if uh, if we were poor, we didn't know nothing about it, man. So So it was a good childhood. Oh no, no doubt. When did y'all move uptown to the thirteenth ward in Valence Street? I was thirteen in nineteen fifty four. Tell us about that neighborhood. Oh well, thirteen ward. That was our neighborhood. I have to tell you a story about me and my friend Melvin. We used to go up when I was a little kid, five years old, we'd go uptown and the Methodist church where my great aunts went would give picnics going to Beat of Spring and Waveland, Mississippi. And me and Melvin, we'd sit next to each other with our feet dangling, couldn't even touch the ground. I mean, we every time I went up there, we sat together, never said a word. We bonded like blood brothers. So when we got together, we started roaming the streets together and getting in trouble, you know? Not not good trouble either, right? Was... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they made it so easy to steal cars. All you needed was a silver paper out of a cigarette pack or a gun pack put it behind the ignition on the three screws and put it in neutral and the car started. So, but we'd bring them back close to where we took them unless we got into a wreck, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was different. And I paid for all that, you know, I know you did. And it must've been hard, you know, going to prison and dealing with all that. What was that like? It was an adventure, you know, like in New Orleans and you of age, you know, you might, look forward to going to jail at least two or three times a week in our neighborhood anyway. You know, the police used to come down and take us to jail and charge us with pending investigation where you had to stay 72 hours. And each time the ship changed it, they would bring you to a central lockup where they had to line up. And if you wind up looking like somebody they're looking for, you'd get a charge on you. Another thing, at 16, I got, got this in my face. Yeah, tattoo. When my daddy got home, he made me scrub it with a brillo pad and optic and soap. The skin came off at the tattoo stage. Oh, boy. He wasn't happy about that. Oh, no, not at all. thing about it, it almost was a skull and crossbone. He would have killed me then, for sure, probably. That would have been, <laughs> that would, that would have been it, I imagine. Um, what kind of influence were your parents on you and your brothers? They were great influence. Like my mother and her brother, my Uncle Jolly, who was the chief of the Wild Chapatulas. Before we were born, they had a chance to go on the road with Louis Primo. And my grandmother wouldn't let him go because of the Jim Crow laws down there and all. So my mother said she would never stop any of us from following our dreams. And uh, she let Charles go on the road when he was 15 with a with a minstrel show and signed for me to sing in an all-blind band on a, in the French Quarter on Bourbon and Toulouse when I was 15 years old. They always wanted to see us, they applaud our singing. I'd sing around the house or whatever, you know, for a company, and they'd applaud it, and they were always behind us. You bring up the Wild Chapatulas and your uncle, Big Chief Jolly. Tell me about the role that George Landry, Big Chief Jolly, played in your life and in the formation of the Neville Brothers. And I also want to talk about the album, The Wild Chapatulas. Jolly, he was like a real... Ratty dude, he had a hip walk. I used to try to imitate his walk and all, you know. And he was a piano player, which me and RT used to follow him, and he showed us things on the piano. And uh, we called it style Funky Knuckle. <laughs> funky Knuckle. Funky Knuckle, yeah. Later on in life, he wanted to, after he got to be the big chief of the Wild Chapel 2, the Mardi Gras Indians, he wanted to do some of his Indian songs. So he called all his nephews down to, to uh, help him with it. And they, that was the first time all four of us got together, at least two or three of us before, but for the Wild Shepherd it was, it was all four of us plus the group, the meters, George, Leo, and Zig, and a guy named Willie Harper helped us with the background. He told us that that was something that, that our mother wanted, and she had passed a couple of years before that, and I, to see all of us together. So we started the Neville Brothers in 1977. You know, your brother R.T. was fond of saying the family that plays together stays together. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, we hung out in a long time, you know, 40 some years. It's amazing. And the chapter that you have in the book is called The Mighty Neville Brothers. But before we talk about that, I want to go back to the Wild Chapatulas. A lot of people are fascinated by the Mardi Gras Indian culture in New Orleans. And the Wild Chapatulas was an uptown tribe in the 13th Ward where y'all were from and where I lived during my college years at Tulane luckiest guy in the world that I got to live in the musical neighborhood, the best musical neighborhood in the world with Benny's Bar and Aaron Art, Charles and Cyril Neville living around the corner from me. 
I remember it so fondly and so vividly. And I would see you all with some of the greatest musicians would come and visit you there. Oh, yeah, it was a spot. And like I said, Cyril started the music there and everybody wanted to play it. I mean, it wasn't that big of a place, you know, that people would hang all outside to hear the music. You know, they'd have a crowd, a couple of hundred people outside. And they didn't even charge admission. They just put passed around a big jug of Kentwood and you put <laughs> put in a couple bucks and that's how everybody got paid. Yeah. And people were generous, you know. Well, I remember y'all would go in there after you played your gig at Tipitina's or at some other place. You, Cyril and other people would show up at Benny's late at night, and that's when it would really get funky. Oh, yeah. You might go in there and see people like John Goodman, Dennis Quaid. You know, they would every time they were in town, they would come up there and visit Benny's Bar. Terry Bradshaw. Yeah, oh, yeah. All of them. And they would come see you at Tipitina's. I, I was the luckiest guy in the world, too, because... I was either in Benny's bar just about every night or I could hear the music coming through my window as I fell asleep. I could hear it coming from under the floor. <laughs> you live closer, that's for sure. Yeah. Part of the reason why the Indian culture is so big in New Orleans is that there's a lot of people of mixed race. You're African-American, white, and also Native American. Choctaw. Choctaw. And so the, the Wild Chapatulas is a Choctaw tribe, right? Well... Jolly started off, the Wild Chapatooth is the name, I forget what they call it, the Big River or whatever, or the people that live on the river. And he took that name because he lived right off of Chapatooth when he started the, the group. And what happened after you all played on that album? What Was that the catalyst for becoming the Neville Brothers and then going out on the road as the Neville Brothers, recording as the Neville Brothers? It was. I mean, like I said, my, Jolly told us that my mother wanted to see all of us together. So I said him and Cyril were with the meters at the time. So they left the meters and said, come on, let's start the Neville Brothers in 1977. And the rest was history. And it was a successful, as you said, 40-some year run. You opened for the Rolling Stones. You played in the Superdome. You played everywhere, all over the... All Grateful Dead. Open up for the Grateful Dead. That's right. Santana, uh, Huey Lewis. We, uh, Bill Graham got us to do the, the Amnesty Tour, which was with Sting and... Peter Gabriel, Lou Reed, U2, John Baez, Miles Davis, a whole bunch of, you know, hard hitters. And uh, that was a great tour. Well, you know, it's interesting. All the greatest musicians in the world looked at you, the Neville Brothers, as musicians, musicians. You were the people that they listened to. Oh, yeah. We were respected. We, we demanded respect. I mean, we, were, we went out and gave our all. And like Art used to say before we go on stage, take no prisoners. <laughs> And that's what you did. I mean, I'll remember being in Tipitina's and you all would come out banging on whatever percussion item you could possibly have. And the whole place would just explode. It would be electric. Oh, yeah. That was a special place. And I was the catalyst for the, for the brothers. That was like one of the first places where they had Tipitina's and they had Jed's up on Oak Street and Jimmy's on Willow Street. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the best places to play, too, and really hone your craft, right? Oh, yeah, no doubt. So when you went to bigger stages, you were ready. Yeah, and you had the greatest audience there. But like Tipitina's, we'd be there, start at midnight and be in there sometime till daylight. Who all couldn't fit in was sitting out on, on the neutral ground. And you could hear it out on the neutral ground as well. Oh, yeah. Whole place was shaking. <laughs> Yellow Moon, the album Yellow Moon, was really the album that put you all in a different level of fame. You had recorded... The Fire on the Bayou album earlier than that, and it was great, well received. But really, when Yellow Moon came out, it was something altogether different, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, it was like Daniel Lanois, who produced it. You know, he came and he placed on St. Charles Street called the Cayums Hotel. He fixed the place up to look like the swamp. He had moss hanging there, he had a, a bobcat over here, an alligator. So the vibe was there. All he wanted to do was bring out what was already there. Most of the guys that wanted to produce the Neville Brothers were trying to put their spin on the Neville Brothers. It didn't work out. So he and Joe Don did the closest job. Some of the songs on that album, Voodoo, Yellow Moon, you wrote Voodoo and Yellow Moon, The Healing Chant, which won a Grammy Award. Right, Charlotte Horman. Yeah, Charles Horman and Wild Engines. But then you also sang some covers of Bob Dylan. And he was at the studio at the time, too. He was sitting there watching. What was that like, right, singing Bob Dylan songs in front of Bob Dylan? I mean, hey, it was cool for me. And he enjoyed it. He he said some nice things about me and his, uh, forget what that was. He did the thing for the Grammys, and they interviewed him for Rolling Stone, I think. 
gave me some praises, you know. And he talked about it in his book, Chronicles, also. And, you know, singing Hollis Brown and With God on Our Side, you know, for me, it made those songs altogether different from when he recorded them. That's what I was trying to do, make it different. I wanted to put my spin on it, you know. One of my favorite things is when you sang on Daniel Lanois' first record also. What was it like recording with him and playing music with him? Daniel was cool. You know, he was like, a, he was like, a, I don't know, a guru. Like, you know, he'd be in the studio doing his dance work with the music and knowing he enjoying it, you know. And he asked me to sing on that song. So I love that song, The Maker. The Maker. It's a fantastic song. Been covered so many times by so many people, but the original with you, and Daniel Anwar is the one that really stands out. I sang it to Dave Matthews and the guy from Fish who did it at the Radio City Music Hall. And they, they called me to do that part with them on it. Incredible, incredible. I mean, some of the songs that you've sang over the years, Everybody Plays the Fool, Amazing Grace, Don't Know Much with Linda Ronstadt, and Don't Take Away My Heaven, Hercules, When Something's Wrong With My Baby. I Fall to Pieces with Trisha Yearwood, all huge, huge songs. Some of them became immense hits. How did you come to record with Linda Ronstadt? In 1984, the Neville Brothers were playing at Pete Fountain's Club in, in the World's Fair Grounds, and Linda Ronstadt was there with Nelson Riddle at the amphitheater. After her show, she came to see the Neville Brothers. Somebody told me she was in the audience. They dedicated a song to her and called up on stage, which she told press leaders that, See, I never do things like that impromptu, you know, just go out without a rehearsal. She said, but I wasn't going to say no to Aaron Neville. <laughs> and I asked for an autograph. She said to Aaron, love, I'll sing with you anytime, any place, anywhere, in any key. The next year, Alan Toussaint and myself were doing an organization called New Orleans Artists Against Hunger and Homelessness. And we were doing a benefit and asked her to come down for it. And she came down and we were in the studio by Alan and we started singing something together, which we both knew because we both came up Catholic, was Ave Maria. And Peter Asher, who was a manager, said, wow, y'all should do a record. And I'm trying to be cool, but I was geeked. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. You know, the rest is history. Man, when you listen to those songs today, it still gives you chills. No doubt. Oh, yeah. They were like, for real. You know, it wasn't no fake or nothing about none of it. You, you're a very religious person and you've grown up with religion. Tell me about the role that religion's played in your life. Religion in my life, my favorite thing is about the footprints in the sand. You know, that's, that phrase, like a guy was walking on the beach with the Lord and he said, Lord, I see him in the hardest times of my life. I only see one set of footprints. He said, son, that's the times I carried you. And I remember each time he carried me through hell and damnation, you know. St. Jude, my mother turned me on him. She'd bring me to St. Jude Shrine. It was in our later Guadalupe Church on Rampart Street. And then St. Anne on Ursuline and Johnson, St. Anne Shrine, where you crawl the steps on your knees and say a prayer on each step. She would bring me there often, you know, and sometimes I'd go there by myself. And the St. Jude, which, speaking of, this is his month. St. Jude feast day is a... October 28th, so I'm starting a, a month novena. And how did it help you through some of the hardest times in your life? I prayed a lot, you know, I was like, I'd be in, in hell, and I'd say a prayer, you know, like in a shooting gallery in New York, in, in one of those boiler rooms. One day I saw a crack in the wall, looked like a cross, and I started praying. She said, oh, get me out of here. But he took his time, so I feel like I had to see what I had to see to have compassion, you know. But you finally did come out the other side and kick drugs and never look back. How did you kick? I went to a rehab after the did the fire on the body album, and I was like 1981, so I was 40. I was afraid, you know, really, the, the kid in me. I knew about the streets, but I knew about the rehab and all that, giving up drugs for good. And so that morning I was in the apartment room. I had a piano and a tape recorder I got from a friend of mine, and I started singing spiritual songs. A poem that I had to recite in front of my sixth grade class was called Lovely Lady Dressed in Blue, Teach Me How to Pray. I put music to that that night, and we did the Never Brothers album, and I came back home and went into rehab. I remember <laughs> I was in there about a week, and this old elderly white lady came up to me. She said, Aaron, when you first came in, I was scared of you, but I got to know your heart, and I was a nice guy. And See, I want to share this book. My daughter gave it to me. I'm, I'm going to give you one. It was called The Greatest Miracle by Og O.G., Og Mandino, to tell you how you were a miracle. There's a part called The God Memorandum in the back of the book. 
which you're supposed to read 100 days, twice a day. I read 200 days, twice a day. So it seeped into your subconscious, and it helped me, you know, you say, like, when your parents got together to make you, there was, like, maybe a billion cells trying to get there. Only one made it. You made it. So, hey, you're a miracle. A lot of people who have kicked bad habits have replaced them with good habits. What are some of the good habits that you took on? I know you really got into weightlifting. I'm still into it, and I pray a lot. You know, that's that's my thing, my 24-7. Don't need no excuses. Just start praying, you know. If I wake up at night, I say some prayers before I fall back. Are you working out every day? No, we do, me and my wife, Sarah, we do it about four times a week. Sometimes we double up. That's great. Well, Aaron, this has been fantastic. I hope that everybody goes out and gets not one copy of this book, two copies of this book. And I want to dedicate this podcast to your brother, RT, of blessed memory. He was really something. And I know you were so close to him. Uh, whenever I was with him, he talked about you. Yeah, he was like a big brother, you know. He would have, uh, when we was in junior high school together, he was the first fighter, you know. He was a school ground, a big tall guy named Paul. RT jumped up and punched him in the mouth and knocked his tongue through his teeth. Then he put him on his handlebars and his bike and brought him to charity hospital. <laughs> so, he was a protector, you know? He really was. Being around the corner from him, he was a great role model to me when I was younger. And throughout my life, I would always think about some of the things that, you know, he told me and, and taught me. So I can't even imagine what it was like growing up with him. It was great. Nothing him, Charles, and Cyril, and my sister, Thelga, and my younger sister, Cookie, she died too early. She was like just graduating from high school. Can we ever expect to see you and Cyril perform again together? I don't know, you know, never say never, but who knows? Right now I'm retired, so I'm I'm chilling. Must feel good. It does. Yeah. Well, Aaron, God bless you and thanks for this interview and and thanks for this wonderful book that, you know, is really a treasure. Sam, you can tell people they would make nice Christmas presents for their friends, you know. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> no doubt about that. I know all the people in Washington listening to this podcast who used to go see you perform with the Neville brothers and solo at Wolf Trap uh, and other places are going to go out and buy this book and buy a couple of them for uh, Christmas gifts. That'd be great. Yeah. Check it out. My life story, my roller coaster. For sure. Aaron, thanks so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 